Okay, so what I want to do before we get this is actually a whole bunch of stuff. From, I think I want to give you too much today, so bear with me and I apologize in advance. But we'll just do it and see what happens, right? Okay. Put the fire hose out. Yeah, fire. This is the fire hose stuff. And what I really, I, I don't. Uh, this part is, is just an explanation of uh, that shows you what we were talking about last week um, with respect to the double entendre. You know, a parallel meaning is, is what that means. And um, but I want to finish up two, so we can kind of, kind of get into it. Um, and we were left off on that. This is a, and she was pregnant and she cried out in pain. And as she was about to give birth, period, there goes there. And, and I want you to notice that too, because that's a really important thing. We know who she's talking about right here, um, because this is not this is Israel. And how do we know this is Israel that the woman is talking about? It's because we know from verse one. Okay, it's very clear from verse one that this is Israel, um, because of the basis of Genesis that we went through last week. But um, what I really want, I wanted to focus in just a little bit on. We're, we were about halfway through it. And the part about being pregnant um, was really an important piece. Um, the other part is the subject of this verb, uh, of, of the verb in this sentence, uh, was the, uh, is, is the, is Israel. She's the subject, okay? And it's like I talked about before, is that you always have to keep the context of who you're talking about. Otherwise, you can get confused. And I, I want to give you just a, a touch of grammar, just for the second kind, of, because it helps explain some of the stuff we were talking about last week. By identifying Israel as the subject, the, the, the main verb in here is the word was, okay, was pregnant. And then the word cried out in pain, um, she was about to give birth, okay. So the, the, the second verb here is the word cried out in English, but it's not the second verb in, the, it is the second verb that's in, in, the, uh, in the word order, but Greek has a very interesting thing, and I told you there's actually two words in here for the word pain. It's not just one word. So they, they should have said pain, pain, or pain, very bad pain. If they translated it right, that's what they would do. But what they did is they encompassed it together. But those two words for pain are in one's called the, uh, just, just for a second, okay, just bear with me. One's <laughs> called the pre present active participle, okay, and the other's called the present passive participle, okay? So the first pain that's here is the pain of giving, it's the pain of labor, okay? And this one here is a very intense pain, and it's a word for pain, very intense, okay? Um, in, in, the, in the Greek, the participle always precedes the main verb, which is is, okay? Which is, which is the word uh, cried in this one here. Um, the, the word cried here is, if I can find it, is the, is the present active indicative, okay? So it's the main verb, cried out, is a present active indicative. And that means she kept on crying, okay? Whenever you have this, this is, this is something we don't have in the English, it's called, and we've talked about it before, it's called linear action chart. It means, it's like the piece where Jesus sits there and he says, and Jesus cried, um, um, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Remember I told you that? Well, he didn't just say it one time. It's in the present active indicative. So it means he kept crying it the entire three hours that he's on, he's on the cross of that, that piece there. Okay? So the cry part is it keeps on. It keeps on crying. Okay? Now these two words, according to the Greek grammar, they are, there's two things that's true of them. Because they have the participle, they go before the word. They go before the, the main verb. So they actually go, to, go here. Okay? So it should have said, that she is in pain, very intense pain, and cried out and gave birth. That's how it should go. Now, what's important about that is that this all happens before the birth, okay? Which is the, which is the object, okay? So we have the birth down here before she gives birth. And um, this is supposed to be quick, by the way. So what, what it's telling us is that all of this stuff happens before the birth. Okay, but this one has a an active meaning here. See, which means it kind of it keeps on. So she she keeps being in pain, and notice that this one here is a passive. Okay, so this is what you would, you would expect that not to be there. Okay, that's what you would expect, and it would go like a normal childbirth, right? She has the pain. She screams out. She has the birth. Okay. But notice what happens here is that before she cries out, she is in birth pains that she keeps on having, 
Okay? She mm -hmm. keeps on having it. It doesn't go away. Then she gets pain on top of that. It's the passive voice. It's given to her. Okay? And this is the part that I was telling you about. This is the intense piece that is for Israel. Is that the reason it's for them is because they have rejected the birth. Okay? They've rejected the birth. And so this right here is, is the nutshell. And this is a horrible thing to say. But if you look at this analogy, it comes up over and over in the scripture. This is the Holocaust. This is the Holocaust. This is why the Holocaust keeps happening. Why does the Holocaust keep happening? Why are Jews continually persecuted? Other than that's the prophecy of Deuteronomy, right? It says you'll be persecuted. Why is that true? <coughs> is that if you reject God's truth and you continue to reject God's truth, what do you get? Pain. <laughs> that's just you get pain. And how long do you keep the pain? Until you accept the truth. That's right. Okay. So this is the this is the drum roll. Okay. This is and, and pay attention. To this this is the drum roll of two thousand years long drum roll. Okay. Until the actual happens, where we get and we'll come into this piece here. When we get to the tribulation, when they accept Christ here, the pain stops. It's done. Okay. It's actually a prophecy. Okay. And what happens? is they have perfection over here in the millennium, okay? So the reason I show you that is that even in the grammar that, is, that it doesn't pick up the stuff it's supposed to pick up, you see the same thing. It explains why the Jews um, continually are persecuted. It's the same thing, is that as long as, and, and this principle I've taught you, is that if I reject God's truth and I continue to reject God's truth, God will take me out. It's called the sin unto death. Okay? It shows up all over the scriptures. Okay? If you continue, and this doesn't, mean, this doesn't mean if I reject him next year, God's going to kill me off. God's very patient. He makes it painful before he kills you off. Okay? <laughs> so what happens is that you do this, and you're saved. Okay? So you, you become saved. Okay? And, you, and, you become saved and then you start going away from God. This is stuff we learned in, um, in Revelation uh, 2 and 3, remember, where the churches did this. He says, I'll take you out. Remember, he says it over and over again. So what happens is that you have two choices. As long as you choose negatively, the pain increases. And in what happens is that there's a natural consequence of bad behavior, right? If I can sit there and say, I have faith in God, so I'm going to go down here and walk down the freeway with my eyes closed. Okay? Uh, that may be faith, but it's faith in bad doctrine, right? And that's why I get run over. Okay? Faith in good doctrine is what helps you. <laughs> okay? but, so there will be natural consequences, but at some point in here, if I don't turn back towards God, God sits there and, and he punishes you, and this is called the sin unto death. Okay? Uh, this, is, this is what Judas Iscariot had. Okay? It, it goes on and on and on. This, this, this exact model is followed. And, we, and I've given you uh, more than a few verses on that. So that's what, so that's what they are doing. That, that happens with both an individual... And it happens with a country. Countries follow the same model. Okay? We're, we're somewhere down here. <laughs> okay? We're somewhere in the fourth. If you look at the fourth cycle of discipline in Leviticus 26, there's five cycles of discipline. We're talking about that. What happens is that it's that last piece. If you look at all the four cycles of discipline, you will find that we have received all four of them. The fifth one's the final one. Okay? But this helps you see that. And all you, for us, what a person has to do is what they do. If, if they confess their sin, they go right back up, and they can go that way. What's that called? And David called that the Bathsheba in incident, right? <laughs> he, he, was a dork. he was a dork. Things went bad for him. Okay? It went really bad. His son, you know, all, you know, you're familiar with all that history. And then when he, he responded back, God didn't take his kingdom from him. In fact, he even got back. So, Restoration. Hmm? Restoration. Restoration, that's right. It is never God. It is, God is like a parent. It is, he, he, or actually, we are like him. <laughs> but from our model, is that we always have the desire to discipline our children and help them get to the good things, right? We want them to be better. We're not, we're not disciplining because we hate them or we want to hurt them. We're disciplining because we know that if they follow that path, it'll get worse. Okay? And that's what you... And so what happens is that when your child restores that, okay, he does what is right and good, you don't keep on punishing him, right? What do you do? He gets a natural blessing from having made a right decision, and you encourage him, and you love him more. And, and love him in the sense that you encourage him in the right direction. 
So that model is always true. Yeah. Okay, so we're done with that. That's first. Uh oh. Every so much. Uh -huh. Got too enthusiastic. Um, the reason I wanted to show this one, I think that was verse 8. Yeah, verse 8. Richard, you only wanted one. Yeah. You didn't want the back copy. Did no, you? Uh, back copy says. Oh, actually. Okay. Escapee. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> she, she gets that for me because she knows I'll have a black mustache if I, if I have my hand too long. So we have a marker. And I want to bring this one up is because this is the chapter where we're going. And I brought it up last week about how it was kind of, uh, it, it kind of folds over itself. So I wanted to kind of show it to you so that you can see it. Okay. So if we read the verse on verse 2, we start out with Israel. And we know it's Israel and the she is there because of verse 1. The only interpretation for verse 1 is Israel, okay? Uh, the sun, the moon, the twelve, it can't be anything else, okay? It can't be Mary. Um, so it turns out to be Israel. But notice what happens is we leap over, we leap over some verses here. We go down to verse 3, okay? So what does verse 3 have? It says, And another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns in its head. We, we, we actually leaped over it. We, we dropped it, Okay? And we started a parallel sign. So now this is the first sign from verse 1. And now we have a second sign. Okay? And this one's going this way. And note what it says here. It says we have an enormous dragon, and we have uh, seven heads, ten horns. Now that is the Antichrist, and we'll get to that. That's a parallel down here. So this verse blocks these two together. The first half is about Satan, the dragon. We're familiar with that. In fact, here's verses, confirming verses on the, dra on the dragon. Um, the word, the word that's actually in the Greek is the word for snake, okay? The Hebrew is this particular one. But the word that's there, the word dragon, um, it's actually not known where we get the word dragon. It, it, it uh, appears to be a, um, a, a, a trans over because the word dragon is the word that's there. And where we get ours, this actually seems to come from what's called the Attic Greek, A-T-T-I-C. And that's just the, that's the Greek language that was... 200 years, it was 500 uh, BC, 200 years before ours. Okay. But regardless, that's where, that's where it comes from. Uh, so I just wanted to make that notation. But look what happens when we go to the next verse. We follow through with the, with the same subject. We've, we've abandoned this one, and we follow the same subject. What does it say? And its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky. That's the original fall of Satan. Okay? That has nothing to do with this verse. It just references back. So the dragon references here to this one, and, and this one we'll, we'll kind of just hold on to for a second. And he says, um, out of the sky, and flung them out of, uh, onto the earth. Okay? When did that happen? Well, that happens in right here, verse 7 through 9. So we're still in the same stream. We're not going back. So we, we pick up the original fall of Satan. Then we pick up a new fall of Satan. And we also include it here. Watch this. It says, The dragon stood in front of the woman uh, who was about to give birth uh, so that it may devour her child at the moment of born. Where did we just go? We just went back to the, the birth. Okay, birth of Christ. Okay. So there's this double piece that's coming through here that we're kind of paying attention to. In verse 5, she gave birth to a son. Who's that? The context is, yeah, a male child who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. Who's that? That's Jesus Christ. So we jump back. Now we have the double entendre. Okay? We started out here, verse 1, verse 2, and then we have a parallel here, and we continue that parallel with Mary. That's how you know that the, 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 the woman doesn't change. What it does is it splits up. It gives you the double meaning of it. Okay? Uh, because the, the rule uh, with the, all the nations in, in the devil uh, scepter, that's, that's the millennium. That's the millennial reign of Christ. You can't interpret it any other way. Uh, and then it says, And her child was snatched up to God uh, and to his throne. What's that? That's both her child, that's the cross and the ascension. Okay? It just threw it in there. Okay? It just, it, 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 it's kind of flushing it out. Okay? And, and the reason I say this is because it helps us, in reality, it helps us identify who's who, okay? It sounds confusing, but what you do is you write it out, and it, it supports one thing, is that there's a double meaning in here. There's a double meaning here, and there's a double meaning here. How do we know there is? Because they threw it in here. 
Okay, and this reference point right here, which is the ten, uh, was the ten crowns, the seven heads, and the seven horns. That that'll follow its own piece. So it lets us know that where we're at, who we're talking about, and when we're at. Okay. So in verse um, six, this is a. It was a six. In verse 6, we have it here, it says, And the woman fled into the wilderness. Now we just flip verses. That's Israel. Right? Mary didn't throw into Israel. This one right here. To a place prepared for her by God. Okay? Now we have a double entendre here, too, because we have Egypt with Jesus and Joseph, which is the wilderness. And we also have um, Israel. And this is the part, this is Matthew 25, also um, and, and look, look where it says, it says, and she was taken care of for 1,260 days. First marker. What is that? Three and a half years. 42 months. Um, from a lunar point of view. Okay? First marker. So where does that put us? Where do we know we're at? Right? We know we're right here. Now we know when this is going to happen. It, it lines the verses up. Okay? Let's keep going. So we're just going to have a little fun with it, okay? Uh, then a war broke out in heaven, okay? This puts us, this tells us where this is at. Where does that war take place? We'll find out in a second. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. Uh, but he, Satan, was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The dragon was hurled down, repeating what was said up here before that, the second half of it. And the ancient, uh, the ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray, that's what he does, okay? He was hurled to earth with, and his angels with him, okay? Um, so we, we, we know where he's at. This is the second piece. So we know at this point, that's where that's happening, okay? If, if it, it also helps, well, let's just go through the rest of this. And we're not going to, I don't want to do this piece right here, because this right here is the verses, um, verses 10, 11, 12 is, is, a plain, is the praise and victorious proclamation of the coming Christ. Okay? I heard a voice out of heaven. Um, we have come to salvation, the kingdom of God, the authority. This is talking about the millennium. This is the piece where we, we take, all of a sudden we're on the earth, and then we take a step back for three verses, and the proclamation in heaven is happening when? On top of each other. Okay? At, at the time that this is happening down here, up in heaven... We're praising the Lord. We're praising the Lord. Guess where we are? We're up there with Him. We're singing these verses. Okay. Meantime, bad things are happening down here. Okay, we know that. For Israel, why is the Israel the object? Okay. One, one of the hardest things to do in Christianity is that we put ourselves in verses we're not supposed to be in. Okay. Um, and we'll actually study some of that even, even coming up. But we, we insert ourselves in stuff, and we start thinking they're talking about us. In reality, it's not talking about this. The focus of the entire tribulation is the Jews. <coughs> We're not going to be there, okay? We leave right here, okay? That's when we leave. We'll show this up better. Uh, he's filled with, uh, it, it tells about all the bad things. that he, The devil's filled with fury. That's verse 12. Um, and then it says what happens down here. Now we can switch back to earth. It says, uh, verse 7, he says, And the dragon uh, he had hurled to earth, okay, this is, that he is God, by the way, um, he pursued the woman, Israel, uh, who had given birth to the male female, okay? Uh, verse 14, the woman, Israel, had give, was given two wings of an eagle. This, is, this is, goes back to over and over again, the two wings of the eagle is the deliverance of Israel against Egypt. It goes on and on. It's in scriptures. And it parallels in here. So that she may fly to a place uh, prepared for her in the wilderness. Okay? We know where this place is at. Right? This is uh, Moab, Edom, and Ammon. Okay? That's the prophecy of Daniel 11. We're familiar with that. It's also the prophecy in uh, Matthew, 24. Matthew uh, 24. Right. So we know where that's at. So we know we're talking about Israel. Where does that take place? Right here. How do we know that? Because the, this puts us in the place where the abomination of domination is, a, a abomination of, of desolation is at, which happens right here, which is at the same time that Satan and the angels get thrown down. Okay? To earth. That's why it all happens. And it gives us another marker here. Where she will be taken care of for time, times, and time and a half out of the serpent's reach. Okay? Times... Time, singular, 
times in time and a half, one half time actually. Now you have to go back to Daniel to find out what that, that is, but this is um, this is one year, two years, half year, <coughs> three and one half years. Back to what we were talking about Oops, over there. And things. So we know the marker. We have another marker. So now we know where these things take place. Even though they sound like they're happening like this, in reality they're happening like this, on top of each other. Every time we see the three and a half year marker, we know where we're at, no matter where, no matter where we find it. Whether it's in Revelation, whether it's in Daniel, which it comes up in Daniel, that's where it initially comes out. No matter where it's at, it's in this piece right here. It's in the Great Tribulation. Even though this is seven years, the Great Tribulation happens in that spot. This is one, all hell breaks loose. Jacob's trouble. Jacob's trouble. This is Jacob's trouble. It's prophesied for thousands of years. Okay? Um, then this tells us a little bit more. It says, In the mouth of the serpent spewed out the water like a river to overtake the woman and to sweep her uh, away with the torrents. Um, and the earth helped her out. This is, this is divine providence, divine protection. Uh, by opening its mouth and swallowing up the river, the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. <coughs> um, and so we know that what happens here is they just kind of, I want to kind of give you the, I don't want you to follow, I want you to just follow it like a story. So you know where it is. So we know here it says, and the dragon was enraged because guess what? God protected her, okay? In the scriptures where I tell you, who, are, who is he protecting them from, Okay. If you remember what happens with the 144,000 here, the evangelistic Jews, they convert Israel. They become all believers. They're the ones that, is, that are in Matthew 24 who are watching and waiting for the abomination of desolation. And what does Jesus say in that? He says that when you see this, when you see the Antichrist put this statue in a tribulational temple, get out of Dodge. Do what Daniel told you to do. Go hide in that specific place. If they know their Bible doctrine, they know what to do, okay? They run, they get there, God protects them, the angels of God protect them from Satan, Satan can't touch them. So what does he do? Verse 17, then the, then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Which didn't so, run. <laughs> which didn't run, that's right. So those who didn't run die, the initial ones, the ones over here. It's like anything, if you don't listen to Bible doctrine, bad things happen to you. Okay? And the rest of it happened is that this is the two witnesses. Remember the two witnesses we spent all this time on? What happens with the two witnesses, they start evangelizing, they start becoming believers, and now Satan is the one who's, per, who, who's now persecuting them. Okay? And that's what that piece is. Those who keep the commandments hold fast to the testimony of Jesus. So, you've just seen the... So now we can call it into this chapter. Um, <laughs> just kidding, sorry, you have to really bear it out. <laughs> but I wanted, I wanted you to see one, the double entendre, it talks about the parallelism that takes place. I wanted you to see the two markers that we talked about. They're on both pieces of it. So it frames us up. So what happens is many people, as, you, as we talked about, as you go through Revelation, people are going, oh, where's this, where's that, where's that? And these are the marker pieces. So what happens is that you know they happen on top of each other. How do you know that the two witnesses happen in here? Is because it has the same 42 weeks in it, 42 months in it. It, has the same, it references it. it. It boxes us in. So we know where things are happening on this side. You, the piece in the scripture where it says that both in Daniel and in Matthew where he makes, it, he makes a, uh, a covenant with the people of God, which is the Israelites, and then he breaks that covenant in the middle. Right? He makes the covenant here, and we know that because he'll be revealed right here. We'll get to it. And he'll break that covenant, and that's when the abomination of desolation takes place, because Satan's kicked out of heaven, and the, and the Antichrist is given full power. And what happens is the first set of Jews who, have been, who, were, who were saved in this part, by the 144,000, by the angels that we talked about before, they all flee. They're protected by God for the entire time. As long as they stay there, they're good. Okay? This is also the piece in Matthew 24, 25, where it's 24, where it says, and it says uh, people will say to you, and this is directed at the Jew, Matthew 24 is directed to the Jews. People will say to you, the Messiah is here, come out, it's safe. Okay? And the morons who do that, which they won't hopefully away, they'll be in here nice and safe. They're safe here because of divine protection. If they come out, Satan will wipe them out. Just like the morons who are here, who became saved, didn't obey the word of God, they die. Okay? So, hopefully, that gives you an idea of why we do what we do, why we frame it up each time, 
so we can tell who's who. It would have been nice to have actually gone through all of this and then walked all the way back to the beginning of Revelation and watched you through it and each time. This is actually one of my goals to do this, I doubt. <laughs> I'm still pretty young, you know. Uh, is to go back through and actually put the verses on top of each other so you can tell where things start and where they end. So you can watch them and see that they are a divine view looking down through them. They're not like this. What happens is people do this. It's like, no, 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 you don't do that. How do you know you don't do that? Because God put markers on them. So you would know that 42 months, 42 months, 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years, over and over and over again. So you would know that the picture happens. So you can sit there and say, let me see, this happens here. The two witnesses are here. The, the, the third woe is here with the demon of salt. Um, this is the part that happens. Uh, the abomination is here. Why do you know that? Because that's where it's at. Um, halfway through, they break the covenant. You just start matching them up. And they all fit over top of each other. Richard, you kind of did that on your graph that you gave us at the beginning yeah. mm -hmm. of all the in line with everything that's in that that one section. You kind of did that there. Yes. I'm sure there's more, but there is. Um, I think the, the the subject of that was different. Oh. So, but no, that's that's perfect. And what I do try to do is I try to do them over top of each other continuously, so that each time you see one, you uh, what you do is you orient at the right time. You see where it's at. Most people don't, they don't know when the things are taking place. This, this would be one of the critical things. There's a, piece in, there's a piece in Matthew 24 where it says, where it actually reaches out from the Word of God and talks directly to the reader. And it says to something like this, and you, the reader who are listening to this right now, talks to them in the present time. It says, note this, beware. And then it gives them the cautions of what they're supposed to do. And what I like about that is that it, it, is, it is God speaking out of the very moment that they're in. To us, it's prophecy. To them, it's real time. It, it's right here. They're right there. And, it, and, that, and that verse is speaking out to them, telling them exactly what to do and what to mind. So, and so, with it, so we know also that the, the first and second world, the two demon attacks, are over here. We know where they fit too. So... The, the, the release of the demons takes place over here. So it helps us grasp some of those things that are, that are in there. Anyway, so that's that. Um, so let's get some real, and that was just the preamble, by the way. Um, I wanted to bring it up because it's not many times it shows up that's in the same chapter um, and talks about everything so, um, where, you actually, where you actually can kind of go through it and say, here, watch, follow this thing. Follow what God's doing here. Um, and the reason I brought that up is because sometimes when God says things, he's, He is speaking an axiom. Okay? And what happens is people get caught in the axiom. The axiom is just a law or principle. They get caught in the axiom and they don't let it go. Okay? They kind of get stuck there. And what you really need to do is you need to identify what God is saying and then move through the sentence. Does that make sense? So... That's what that's supposed to do. Uh, I think 12, 11 was difficult, but I think 12 is difficult because if, unless you understand the double entendre that's taking place and you, and you, you see the succession of the sentences and the entire flow of the chapter, it's difficult to figure out where you're at. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But when you look at it as one continuum and you just identify stuff, it helps you realize where you're at. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they figure out that everything is happening at the same time, not yes. just like one after another. That's right. And I think people get confused because people see the the bowls, the woes, and the trumpets. Uh -huh. Think it's all linear. Like yes. Most of that stuff can actually. Uh, well, some of the, when some of those bowls of trumpets or other stuff going on, there's right. something else going on too. That's right. And That's right. It's just not just one thing. Right. Exactly. You know, the horsemen. Sometimes they're well. Where's the horsemen fit? And where's the and where's the vials? Fit? Where's the vial judgments? You know, you, you, once you start looking at it from the red markers, you start stacking them up, and you say, okay, at the same time this is happening, this is happening. See that piece right there? When that part happens, and and, and, that, and that's going on there. At that same time, uh, Israel's being destroyed. Seven thousand people just got wiped out. And by the way, the two witnesses are talking at the same time that the eagles are going over. At the same time, the angels are speaking. And at the same time, the martyrs are speaking in the other chapter. So in reality, is that you're right. The entire thing that we're looking at from verse 5 through 19 all happens in that one period of time. 
It, it doesn't mean it doesn't reference things out of it, like I just showed you. It referenced things from the fall. That's what we hear. Reference the one-third fell. That was from the beginning of time. But it also sit there and say, okay, but here we are here. Now we have this, we have these heads, horns, and crowns. Where's that at? Okay, that's the future part. So it helps you, helps you identify what's what and not get confused with it. So you're probably completely confused. But, <laughs> but, but I want to assume is that, that, that you, you, um, you note the axioms. You note the, the doctrine, but you move on in it, okay? So, hope that makes sense. Um, so now we're going to jump over, we're going to dismiss the first two verses, okay, because we're on another subject now. This is almost, it's not parenthetical, it's actually parallel, okay? Um, it says, uh, um, this is verse 3. Um, so let me say this in advance again. My purpose is not to teach you this, it is to give you an overview. Okay? Because in reality, we're gonna have when we finish this chapter, we're gonna stop and do about six months in, in Philippians, and then we're gonna come back to the Antichrist and start right on top of him. It's a natural division. Uh, but I want to give you some things about him uh, and, and where he shows up here, because he does show up here. Um, in this little piece, and so who we know what these things are, um, and, and the verses that I'm referencing here are the verses that help us understand what these mean. If you don't know what they mean, you can't sort them out. Okay, they're, they're, you'll you'll think they're things that they're not. But what happens is that all three of these are carried true through Daniel uh, and through all the Revelation. They're carried through exactly. So once you establish what are the heads, what are the horns, and what are the crowns? It helps you not only identify who it's talking to, but it helps you understand the entire principle of it. Okay? And the, the, the number of them, is that? Yeah, it's significant. Yeah. Oh. Well, yeah, when it, when it does this piece right here, that right there is an identifier, identifier of the Antichrist. Right there, it's just, see, as soon as you see it. Horns represent power. Power, that's right. So. That would be uh, probably yep. the beast himself for them. Yeah, that's exactly true. Yeah, it, it's the powers that are that are the that heads, are uh, they encompass. And crowns, you know, we'll, we'll talk about what they are. Sometimes these change, um, and what it will change is it'll depend on what side we're on. Uh, an example is that um, sometimes the horns will change because, and the, and the crowns may, because of how it's looking at it. And it also sit down. I'll to give you an example. He'll be, they'll have one in, in 17, we'll say, uh, and the eighth king, and he is the eighth king. And, and you, you're trying to figure out, well, who's the eighth king in the seven heads of the seven horns? You know, and, and you have to kind of know the history of it, of what happens in the thing, and you know that from other pieces of it. You have ten crowns, and there's three, two, three, and the Antichrist comes out of the seventh. And conquers this and becomes the eighth king. So if you if you does that make sense? Seven, one, and this is this is the prophecy. Okay, but it, it talks about the eighth king, and, you, and all of a sudden you're, you're that's in Revelation 17. You go, where's an eighth king? I don't remember an eighth king. There's only, there were seven, and there was ten, and so and, and there's seven horns, and there's seven heads. So where's the eighth? You know, so you, what we'll do is I'll, I'll tell you who these are, and then as we go through them, they will sort out. Okay. So this piece here, you'll need to, um, you'll, you'll want to keep this, although you probably won't remember it, we'll come back to it, but this shows up in virtually every single chapter afterwards, especially after we establish 13, which is our next chapter, because that's where the Antichrist starts having an impact, and the Antichrist, of which there are two, as you remember, okay, they will show up in this thing, they will actually answer prophecy that's in Daniel. The details will be in Daniel, not in Revelation. Okay. Um, we actually went through this when I did Daniel, which feel bad for those people. That was three and a half years. <laughs> Twelve chapters. We got them beat. I did. Yeah. Uh, we, no, we have twenty-four chapters. We, have, you know, yeah. <laughs> but you don't want to let any ribbon not be beaten, right? <laughs> so let's kind of go through this thing. Um, and like I said, I, I want you to get the overview. That's what I'm looking for. We're going to be going through and dissecting every single piece of this because they show up in every chapter. And we're going to be referencing them and putting them in the right spots. Um, then the other sign appeared in heaven, an enormous dragon, red dragon, 
uh, with seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns on its head. Okay. Um, the Greek on there says, uh, Then appeared another sign in heaven, and behold, uh, the dragon, uh, the great dragon that is red, uh, has uh, seven horns, the seven heads, uh, ten horns on his head, and seven crowns. Um, the, uh, the first verse I want to look at is, that, is to identify, so we know who the first one is. The second one we have to identify, we really have to kind of go back to this piece. And what I did, um, you can have these things now, I, I, I kind of wanted to identify some things in them. Um, because what this is, this is an entire map. Um, it's a horrible map, but you give a kid a color crown, that's what they do. Um, but what it does do is it establishes the, um, it establishes what's called the seven heads. And they're important because they show up. And they're, they're hard for people to describe. And if you, if you listen to a lot of people in prophecy, they will murder the heads. Okay, they do over and over again. Um, but the key verse actually happens right in here for us to know who they are. But I want you to know who the Antichrist is. So let's figure out our orienting point. Okay? Um, and we have to figure out our orienting point all the time. So this is the Great Trib over here. This is the 70th week. Right? This is three and a half. Three and a half. Okay? This is the rapture of the church. This is the second coming. This is the thousand year reign of Christ. End of time happens right there. Eternity starts here. White throne judgment. <coughs> there. The uh, judgment seat of Christ is here. Called the demon seat. We are here someplace. That goes back. I hope that we're actually right here. But... <laughs> tonight, tonight, tonight. Tonight, tonight, yeah. I'm done with all the fun. Um, so let's go, let's go to uh, 2 Thessalonians so we can identify who's who here. Because we just talked about the, the Antichrist uh, and, his, and his brief understanding of, of him. Um, 2 Thessalonians. You, um, I have eight and nine here. So that's just read. what I'm trying to do is I'm, the I'll I'm going to tell you the answer because I don't want to go over all the verses. Okay. Uh, so on eight and nine it says um, it says uh, and the lawless one that's the antichrist uh, will be revealed. That's just a, a prophecy of uh, whom the Lord will overthrow. Um, with the breath of his mouth and destroyed by the splendor of his coming. So we know when the Antichrist is going to go up in smoke, that's right here, right? That's what that's. So Jesus is just telling us the answer. Um, and we know that he, uh, along with both the Antichrist, both the false prophet and the, what we would call the, the leader of the Roman, uh, the Roman Empire, they both go and they're thrown into the lake of fire. Okay? Um, and they're actually the first two people ever to go into the lake of fire, which is interesting, is that God prepared it. And you know this in Matthew, that he prepared it for, his, for the fallen angels and for Satan. But in reality, the first people who go there are the Antichrist and the false prophet. And they're there 1,000 years before the white throne judgment. So they're there for 1,000 years before that ever takes place, which is kind of a good history point. But that's what it's talking about here. Um, and it'll be with his breast. That's com perfectly consistent with Revelation 19, which says with the breath of his mouth. That's the battle of Armageddon. He will, that's also uh, how he will destroy them. And with the splendor of coming, second advent. Okay? So it tells us all the details there. Uh, verse 9, uh, the coming of the lawless one uh, will be in accordance with the work of Satan, uh, displayed with all kinds of miracles, uh, counterfeit miracle signs, and wonders. Now the piece is, it'll be the work of Satan. This explains why we see them on top of each other. Okay? In the verse that we just read, this explains why we see it as the verse before. It says, um, what is it? Oh, it's right here. It's right in front of me, that verse. Um, where it says, the red dragon with the seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns. Okay? So the first part says the dragon. And the other part that's on top of it is the seven heads, seven horns, 
ten crowns, or whatever. This is the Antichrist. This is the work of him. So it gives us that parallel. This is just reaffirming something we already see. That makes sense? Yeah. Um, the part that I wanted to talk about before is that we know when the Antichrist is revealed because it tells us in this verse. It, says, it tells us in, in not the verse, in this chapter, chapter 2, starting at verse 3, it says, Do not anyone deceive any, anyone. He says, That day will not come until the rebellion uh, occurs and the lawless, uh, the man of, of lawlessness is revealed. Now, the, the word rebellion, and I'm only telling you this because this, it doesn't make sense, is, is apostasia. Okay? S T. That's not right, but it's apostasia. It means to depart. And they use the word rebellion because to depart from the truth is rebellion. But this is not the rebellion. There's, there's a lot of parallels on this thing. A lot of people talk, talk about this with reference to the church. The word here is to depart. Now look who it's talking about here. The reference here is to depart. Let's just keep that in our mind for a second. Um, he says, verse 2, He will, he will um, well, until the rebellion occurs and the lawless one is revealed, the man of doom to destruction. The man doomed to destruction. That's talking about the Antichrist. He says, He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God and is worshipped, so that he will set himself up as in God's temple, proclaiming, him, proclaiming himself to be God. Who is that? That's the Antichrist. Okay? That's very specifically this guy who gets revealed. So when does he get revealed? He says, don't you remember um, that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things. What does this mean? This means that Paul is telling the Thessalonians, you remember the 90 days I was with you? I taught you all about the Antichrist. Okay? One of my big jokes is that we don't teach people that stuff for years. But in reality, it's an important part of prophecy. It's an important part of the basic ABCs of Christianity. It should be taught in the first 90 days. Okay? Um, I used to tell you these things. It's in verse 6. It says, And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. And that's always true. That's Satan. Satan, Jeannie and I were talking about this. Satan is continually trying to bring out his Antichrist. Since the first rejection of, of Jesus Christ in Matthew 4, he has been trying that. But God sits there and says, no, you will not. Okay? Um, and it says, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. Who is that? Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the departure. Okay? Who does he depart with? Us. Us. Us who, have the, us who have the Holy Spirit. And then the lawless witness one will be revealed. So his prophecy is saying is that when the Holy Spirit is removed, depart, departure takes place, we go with the departure of Christianity, then and only then is the lawless one revealed. So we know he's going to be revealed. Right here. That's what gets revealed. The beginning of the thing. Because remember, he makes the contract for the whole seven years and breaks it in the middle, right? If you, put, if you start paralleling those things, you see that he has to start here, okay? And this is when he takes full assumption. And this is when Satan is brought down. All that stuff just falls, falls into place. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, and who is this guy? We're going to go to Revelation 13. We're just going to do um, one and two, although the rest of it's all in here. Um, that was funny because one says, um, and the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. This is actually part of verse 12. Should be. Because it's the natural divider of the subject before and the subject after. But whoever put the numbers in didn't put them in right. We find that actually that's pretty common. Uh, and I saw the beast coming out of the sea. Okay? The beast is the first beast. This is the Antichrist. We would call him the king of the West. That's what he's properly called. And he comes out of the sea, and the sea is the world. This is the same <clears throat> reference that's used in Daniel 7 and in Daniel 2. Okay? He had ten horns, seven heads, and ten crowns when he comes out of the sea. For his horns, and on each head, 
is a blasphemous name. This is the first clue of what the horns, of what the heads mean. Okay, um, the beast resembled uh, a leopard, but had the feet of a bear, and the mouth was like a lion. And the dragon gave the beast the power, and his throne in great authority. What authority? The ruler of the world. He gave it to him. Uh -huh. This is the great big mouth. <laughs> it goes on top of that. Um, and there's another piece in here that we'll, we'll get to. But what I wanted to look at is that the, 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 um, each, each head has, uh, has a blasphemous name. And with this heads there, and I'll tell you where you find it. You find it actually right here. These heads are the heads of, of religions. And they are the religions of the seven empires that have, and I put them on the, on the sheet of paper here. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the, the seven empires that ruled over um, Israel. Why Israel? It's the center of the entire subject. Okay. So we know what those are. We know what they are by time. If you, I, I drew you a picture from time, and they go across. You know, G Egypt. Uh, that's not too hard to figure out, right? That's the captivity, 400 years. Who was the next one? The Assyrians. How do we know that? 721 BC, Northern Kingdom was conquered. Who's the next one? It's the Chaldeans. Okay. Most of the people know that. Um, most people know that as the they call it the Neo Babylonians. That's Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. We know that ends with uh, the Persian Empire. Okay. Who's that? Cyrus the Great. Okay. That's the conquest we see with Daniel. The handwriting on the wall happens right here, right in the middle of that. Okay. Um, and that's actually called the Medo-Persian. This is also when the captivity takes place between these two. Captivity happens here, released over here, remember? Um, then we have the Greco-Macedonian Greco Empire. That's Alexander the Great, the Four Horns, that's the next empire. And notice that what happens is that each time Israel is under one of these empires, each time they are, okay? And then we have the Greco-Macedonian, and then we have the Roman. Okay. And what happens with the Roman one is that we only see one half of it. This is the and it, it talks about it in, in chapter seven. And so the next one happens, and these all have their own religions. Okay. We're, if you're familiar with the with the studies, if you, if you spend time in it, you know each of these has a religion that stands on top of the of God. Any time that they are cap under captivity, uh, the Israelites, they are ruled by these gods. And, they, and they're influenced by them. Okay? And then on this side, we have, so far, this one hasn't started at least that we know of. Okay? We have a break in here. Okay? This one ended, some people say, most people would agree about 700 AD, Roman Empire ended. Okay? And uh, this one into the Hellenistic part of it here. But on the other side, you have what most people call the revived Roman Empire. This is why everybody gets excited when the European Union took place, is that here is the reunification of the Roman Empire. And we know that from a couple of things. We have the, the legs of iron, mm -hmm. chapter 2 of Daniel. And what do we have here? Iron mixed with clay. Iron mixed with clay, toes, the feet. Okay. We, uh, and I wrote some stuff down here. You can actually... The, um, the, 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 this little box right here is, is the divide. That each time it tells us in the scripture, there will be a divide. Okay? So this is how we know we have the Roman Empire on one side, and we have the Roman Empire on the other side. But we have a break. So far, that break has been 1,300 years. Right? There hasn't been any Roman Empire around since 700, since, what is it, Odebacher the Great? I think that's what his name was. Um, was captured. It ended there. So, so far it's been 1,300 years. There's been a break in here. But that will renew, and when that renews, it'll be right here. Okay? The revived Roman Empire. Now, what it may do is it may float into it. We actually may be, and, and, and I, I wouldn't say because no day is known. Nothing that. And so, I sort of, if you give it a day, you're going to be wrong. <laughs> God will make sure of that. But in reality, is nobody knows that day. But we actually could be floating in the beginning parts of that, in the unification of the Roman Empire. We don't know, because no man knows, not even angels know. Okay? We could be floating into that. In reality, we could be moving like this. Okay? And we could be actually here. 
and moving into that. We will know when that takes place based on 2 Thessalonians is that this is when he will be revealed and how will he be revealed? He will be the genius amongst everybody. He will be the guy who gives all the answers. He will sit there and say, let me explain to you how those 10 million people disappeared. Right? I'm just being generous, I think. Maybe it's 100 million. I'm hoping it's 200 million. In reality, the church right now is like 200 million. That's what it says. But I suspect there's only 100 that are really going to make it. That's 10 to 6, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I don't know, but it, this is the part where it sits there and says, uh, many people will say that they know me, but they don't. It's, uh, that's the truth of that. So there'll be this break in here, and then this will be revived, and that revival will happen right there. He will take control, the empire will be ushered in. Um, what's interesting here is that we also have the beast, right? The first beast. I think that's the bear. The second beast. The third beast. And the fourth. And the fourth. This is one of the, this is the one that's different than all the others. This is the beast where it sits says that I believe from the scriptures and this says this is when the faith when the fatal fatal uh, uh, the fatal wound. And the people will be amazed. It's talked about in seventeen, verse seven, chapter seventeen, right here it says, and people will be amazed to see that the beast came back. Yeah, 1,300 years, yeah. This empire is revived. This is the fourth beast. This, everything, you, see, you read the description, the first half of the description of the fourth beast is here. The second half of the beast is here. When they talk about him, he always starts here. He ends up over here with, with, with ten crowns, horns, and heads. Okay? So we're out of time for the first thing. So the overview here, and, and this is... Um, so it, it actually kind of captures all that. You can, you can see the heads that are in here. And these are all the religions that, and, and, and I'll say what it does, it, in verse, oh, this one here, in verse 9, actually in chapter 7, I think it's just before that, it says the woman uh, who, sits, um, who sits on the ten hills, and a lot of people use that as a reference to Rome. Um, those hills are not hills of Rome. Those hills, the one here it's talking about, is the prostitute, is the whore of Babylon. That's what that woman's talking about. That's the context of that. She sits on he seven hills. She sits on seven hills. Okay, there is seven hills in Rome. People cross over, but that's not it. These are the seven hills that she is on. It's talking about her. She's the subject of that verse. Okay, and these heads are the heads that are the empires that have ruled over Israel in its entire existence, from from top to bottom to end. Okay, so it helps us have some idea of what that is. Um, you can see some of that in here. Um, this is the woman who's talking about specifically. This explains who the heads are. The nice thing about the heads, the head is the part that references. Once you understand it, you, you take that reference back and you use it where we're at right now, which is the piece that she has seven heads. Okay. So it tells us, what does that tell us? What do we already know about the, the king of the West? Okay. King of the West does two things. He's the Antichrist. Okay, that's what you call him. What do you know? He dominates two things. He has a civil, right? And he has a religious. He is the ruler of both. He is the, he is the ruler of all ecumenical religion in the world. That means general religion. That's why at the beginning of the thing, he makes a truce. He makes a truce with him. He accepts all religions. Okay? Why does he do that? It's because Satan is the author of all religions. Okay? He is the author of it. And that's why they're all acceptable to him. All the way until this piece. So right here, he is the king of that. Okay? He is the king of the whore of Babylon. Okay? I'm not going to get in any Catholic troubles with this one, so I'm just going to leave that alone for the time being. Okay? But he is also the ruler of the, of the empire. Okay? He's also the ruler of that empire and reaches that empire. It is the most powerful empire in the world. In reality, there will be four other ones. We've talked about those. There will be four other. The, the king of the west, the king of the north, the king of the south, the king of the, south, the, king of the east. Uh, but they will all be under him. They will all work in conjunction with him. And why will they do that? It's because he will be the, he will be the religious leader of the entire world. Okay? He will be the civil leader 
of the revived Roman Empire that will actually be the rule of the entire world by default. Okay. So, we'll leave it there for the time being. Can you just go over the woman on the hills again? The woman on the hills, is, is, it comes out of here, and it's the whore of Babylon. Okay? H-O-R-E. The whore of Babylon, they call her. They also call her the, um, the prostitute, the, 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 the whore who sits on the, on the red beast, sits on the beast. Um, the beast is him. Okay, and the whore sits on him. Okay, and the whore is that who prostitute. If you look at scripture, every time Israel or we are away from God, we are prostituting ourselves to Satan. One of the religions. That is true over and over and over again. If you remember when we were talking about the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, what, is, what does God say about the southern kingdom? You were twice the whore your sister was. Talking about the northern kingdom. It's prostitution. It's not sexual. It is, it is religious. Okay? And she is, she is the, what's called ecumenical religion. It means it's a general religion. It's the part that, oh, you'll, you'll recognize it. Coexist. That's her name today. Coexist. Can't we all just get along? No. <laughs> That's who she is. That's the whore of Babylon. Okay. If you don't like this flavor, we got one over here. Okay. If if you don't like one that's peaceful, we have some that murder. Okay. I'm not gonna tell you what they are. You already know. But you find the flavor that you want. I've got it for you. That's what Satan said. You got it. I, I've got it. the only one you can't have is this little narrow one. And he has this name. And you just, that, that's the only one. I've got, I've got 359 other ones. And they're all better. They're sweeter. You get to do what you want. Don't be all that. You don't need that one. So you get the idea. So that's the seven hills. The seven hills are actually seven mountains, empires. Okay. That's what he sits upon. That is the stuff that he sells continually. Has sold it since the beginning. Okay? He doesn't change. Okay? So let's pray before we get in trouble with not being what's supposed to be. Look this over. We'll come over it next week. I'll do a sweep over it again. The nice thing if I if I I won't, so I'm not even gonna say it. I'm not gonna clean it up. I, um, I could clean it up a little bit. But it shows you where everything's at. It's kind of one big full view. But it helps us understand this thing. And we're going to run into it over and over and over again. Dearest, gracious, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you that you write everything in there. Thank you that uh, you equip us, that you show us, that you, you give us the opportunity to see it if we will look. And to know it better if we dig deeper. That this is the knowledge we need to fight the world as it is today. The one that offers everything to everybody and even tells you it's good. I ask these things in Jesus' name, one and only name, by which we can be saved and be fine. Amen. Amen.